Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everyone today. Um, this is our Ancestry in Action workshop series. We are virtual again this year, and our program today is going to be The Power of the People, Voices via Petitions, and uh, Diane L. Richard is going to be our wonderful speaker. Uh, she's been doing genealogy research since 1987, and since 2004, professionally focused on the records of North Carolina and Southern states. Uh, she regularly contributes to Internet Genealogy and Your Genealogy Today. Uh, she even appeared on an episode of Who Do You Think You Are? Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Diane. Thank you, Diane, for being here. Well, thank you, Suzanne. I'm excited to be doing this. I, as I was uh, saying earlier, there was so much I want to share and we only have so much time. Uh, so with that, let me jump in here. A uh, few housekeeping uh, tidbits. Um, I won't answer questions until the end, uh, but feel free to put them into the chat or Q&A boxes. And in, in the meantime, I know that's one advantage of virtual, we can do that. Uh, most resources are included in the handout. Um, because I work on my talks till the very last minute, I sometimes add things to the talk. I'll normally put a URL there so that you'll know that. I do show real documents and things in my presentations. But you don't have to read anything. I know there's a tendency to want to try to read it. Uh, feel free to do that. But I don't want you to uh, get too stressed about it. I'll let you know what I want to highlight. And I will be zipping through this topic. I usually always have a lot to say and not as much time as I would like uh, to say it in. I put the Google here um, to remind everybody to use Google or the web search of your choice, because I will bring up sites and to look at URLs or even to go through the handout that you will have received. Sometimes it can be faster to just Google the name of a website. Um, so please keep that in mind. And I want to let you know that this talk strongly focuses on where one can find petitions in North Carolina. I actually live in North Carolina, though my children are Texans. Uh, they were born in uh, Plano Hospital. Um, a few decades ago now uh, at this point. And I've lived here ever since. And so I have a really in-depth perspective on North Carolina records. But I want you to use that to leverage for uh, Texas-specific, but also elsewhere. And I do include some Texas-specific records, including uh, Fort Worth and Collin County, because I can go into depth um, for where things are in North Carolina. And I know many in Texas, your ancestors came from North Carolina um, or Virginia or Georgia or South Carolina, Tennessee, et cetera. And these records are gonna be very uh, similar in those other uh, original states in terms of the process. Also, um, I don't know if you've heard about the legal genealogist, Judy Russell, and I want you to kind of channel her uh, because the law is what tells us who are the legal authorities that could be petitioned and about what. And a certain amount of uh, the reasons that we find that petitions we find are rejected are because it ends up that somebody did not petition the correct authority. Um, so definitely look for her website. And she has a great blog um, to follow. Uh, which is very helpful, again, to give you a sense of uh, where to look for the legalities. In essence, why are we, you know, petitions? Because petitions are a means by which one person or a few people or a community or even a few counties, et cetera, can try to change the status quo. There's something that they want to be different. And much of our early legislation in our country is a result of petitions. I think you're gonna be surprised by some of the topics of what had to be petitioned that are now handled by local government authorities. Because once these petitions occurred, then legislation occurred in terms of how to handle these matters going forward, then they got handled by other places. They did not have to be, there did not have to be official petitions. It was then legislated into law. And we have our First Amendment, obviously, of the Constitution, which basically says that you can petition the government for the redress of grievances. But petitions didn't start with the Constitution. Um, so actually, our story will start uh, before we became a nation and we were a colony. 
and the talk stops with the Civil War. Um, what happened is once you hit the Civil War, a lot of your southern states uh, redid their constitutions in 1868. So it changed a lot of how government was being handled at that point, And it just made a convenient break point. So the focus is on the colonial era and then state and level petitions. So I also want to say that I really don't talk about federal petitions uh, because that would be a whole other topic. So we could talk about petitions for a whole week and we have less than an hour. But I did want to point out a uh, particular uh, petition. Uh, this is a website that was actually uh, suggested uh, in a conversation I had for the Texas State Genealogical Society Conference last weekend, and it caught my eye. Give us pure lager beer petition. Uh, it was a petition out in New York because I just wanted to remind you that there's just a lot of things that got petitioned about uh, regardless of who was petitioning, where and when. Here is not a comprehensive list at all, but I want to share with you uh, this list to show you some of the types of things that could be petitioned. Now, a few of these we will talk about in a little bit more detail. Most we won't. Um, again, there's only so much time, but it's everything from divorces to counties to wars, name changes, manumissions, build a road, uh, build a railroad, build a canal, ferry. You want to establish a bank. You want to establish a school. You want to form a town, operate a county poorhouse. It had to be legislated that the county could do that, whether they did it or not. Request a pardon um, because you've been found guilty in a county court. Uh, for some reason, possibly. Uh, so requesting convictions overturn, land grant related, land being valuable, all kinds of grievances, et cetera. And there's, like I said, so many more. We'll talk about a few of them. So to whom could you, you could petition? So let's kind of look at the basics. As a colony, the king is ultimately who you could petition. Um, in most cases, it was actually whoever he had given authority to uh, within the colonies. Then a general assembly or equivalent legislative bodies um, once we hit the Revolutionary War. Governor could be petitioned. Also county courts or equivalent local authority. So again, keep these in mind because based on time period, you had differing options. So first, we're going to talk about the colonial period, um, which is, in essence, the king, but mostly it was indirectly through his governing representatives, though a lot of it did end up going in front, going to England uh, to be handled there. So in North Carolina, <coughs> we have this uh, great series called Colonial and State Records, and that's because the State Archives of North Carolina worked extensively to collect colonial area era documents um, housed in England, Scotland, and Spain. And the reason I mentioned this is the way they had to collect stuff, one, it's not just North Carolina specific, a lot of it covers the colonies at the time. And so that makes it of use to researchers doing colonial research um, in the colonies at the time. But also the fact that you a lot of people came through North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina wasn't always the state people stayed in, but a lot came through, um, whether they were coming from Virginia or South Carolina into the state early or coming down the Great Wagon Road later into the western part of the state. So a lot of our ancestral history actually starts within the United States as we know it now along the East Coast and then it was Western migration. Uh, which is how many eventually got it to Texas. Um, there's two series. One is called the Colonial and State Records called the Green Series, and that's because the spines of the book actually are green, but it is digitized and online. So it makes it a very easy resource uh, for us to be able to access. And here's an example of a very early petition that I found there from June 1680, and they're pet petitioning the king. And it's the in inhabitants of Albemarle County. This would be Northeast Carolina, which is where um, individuals first lived. And it tells what their grievance is, and then it's always signed by someone. So this is a very typical element of a petition is essentially it's addressed to somebody. They have a grievance. They talk about how they would like it remedied or not. And then you have individuals who sign. 
Now there's also a red series, which is now 12 volumes. Uh, the 12th volume was just published actually earlier this year. And it's called red because it has a red binder. Now these are not available online. Um, they can only be purchased, but a lot of libraries will have them. And if your library doesn't have it, you can always use interlibrary loan. Um, and this is a different series there. You, if you were to look at the, the two, um, this, the first one is they're both colonial. This one is really early colonial and how higher courts in the church, where the other series, uh, it has a much broader scope uh, to it. There's also colonial court records that have now been digitized on what's called North Carolina Digital Collections. So that gives us access to some of them. And it does provide a listing of which CCR or colonial court records collections are included. And it ends up that CCR 193, there is also something called Transcribe North Carolina, which is using the platform from the page. And from the page is a crowdsourced platform that many state archives, uh, universities, libraries, and other institutions have been using, especially during this pandemic, uh, to get material crowdsourced. Um, and crowdsource means using a lot of hands to make uh, work light, as we say, so that we can materials that are digitized can now be transcribed and then searchable. And so because of this, I could go to this collection, search on petition, and then I could see the various transcribed documents that had the word petition in them. And then these will be linked to the collection I just showed you called North Carolina Digital Collections so that it will all be in one place. Now, foreign archives, if if you remember, I mentioned England, Scotland, Spanish archives, and these have their own finding aids. And for the British records, because that's by far the largest collection, it's broken down by the entities. So not all of these entities or types of records will necessarily have petitions in them, but there's a whole bunch of PDF uh, documents that they have created under each category. So it might take you a bit of work, but it still is giving us um, access to records that were previously not accessible. And as mentioned before, these are not just North Carolina records. They're re all records that involve North Carolina, but many of those were addressing the colony as a whole. So now, Let's, we have the Revolutionary War. So now we're in the post-Revolutionary War. So now we're dealing not with the colonial government, we're dealing with state governments, um, often called General Assembly or something similar. And what you have are what are called public and private laws. And public laws are things that affect a large number of people, many locales, counties, jurisdictions, et cetera. And they're sometimes due to a petition. Sometimes the government just decides it needs to make something happen. Sometimes they are petitioned about it. But you also have private laws. And private laws almost always actually are based on a petition of some type because it's individual or small groups of people who want something to happen. And to illustrate, here is a list um, from a book showing the public laws for that particular year. And these, this is 1820, the laws of North Carolina. Now look how many private laws were then instituted in that same year. And the majority of these are going to have be, exist, come about because of a petition. And what's nice is we can go back to that North Carolina Digital Collections again. We can now find General Assembly session records. <coughs> and we can actually look up to the years 1814 in this collection. So if I find a petition that's 1814 or earlier, I can get the details and look at the original. We also have the North Carolina Genealogical Society Journal, which I happen to be the editor of, um, though not with, uh, during the years of um, this resource, but the previous editor published abstracts covering 1777 to 1785. So again, many libraries will have copies of the North Carolina Genealogical Society Journal or members can access all the old journals so that you have a quick way if you're looking for petitions in that eight year time period.
And I'm throwing this back up because this is now, these are some of the petitions that I discovered in the course of just looking through the General Assembly session records. And so again, translate this to where you're researching, whether it is North Carolina, whether it is in Texas or elsewhere, because these again are the types of things. It's new counties, inheritances, uh, taxes being collected, militia, elections, divorce, confiscate, altering county lines, new towns, and more. So again, so much, not just in the colonial time period, but in that revolutionary war and after and well into the 1800s, into including the late 1800s, petitions were a constant source um, of impetus to get laws established, whether again, they're private laws or public laws. So I wanna talk about a few specific um, things that were petitioned because sometimes these are surprising to people. So in North Carolina between 1814 and 1835, only the General Assembly or a County Superior Court could grant a divorce. And let me tell you, very few divorces were granted at this particular period of time. This is an 1813 Wayne County uh, petition, which in a way it is, it's, it's a, a sad petition. Uh, I feel sorry for the person who uh, is being, who's being petitioned about here. The bottom line is, is this guy got really drunk, uh, married someone and then woke up and uh, was regretful of that. And you can see here, he said, your petitioner further states that in the morning when he awoke to his inexpressible mortification, there lay by his side a huge mass of creation purporting to be of the female sex who called herself Mary Jackson. So he was very unflattering towards this person. And I'm not sure who gained or lost um, because his petition was rejected. So given his perspective on his marriage to her, it might have been better if they were to be divorced, but divorces were really rare. It was not as much of an option. And now here's a 1810 divorce petition. It was signed by over 150 people petitioning in support. Now imagine that 150 people or more petitioning and support, signing a petition in support of, in this case, your divorce. And it also creates quite a fan club uh, community. Hopefully you've heard the, the term coined by Elizabeth Sean Mills. Um, fan club is friends, associates, and neighbors, because sometimes we don't find the answers to our own family through our family records or researching our family. Sometimes I have to look at the neighbors and other people. And that's especially important for this petition because Martin County is a Burke County. So there aren't a lot of records that survive at the time period of this petition. So other than some federal census records, um, which would have been held separately, this really gives you such a snapshot of part of this county in 1810. And that's something that legislative petitions are, they're neat for so many reasons. It's not just the topic of them, but sometimes what they reflect about a community. They're so rich. And I want to show you the other, the page, these are original signatures. So I love collecting original signatures when I'm doing genealogy research. Um, and a, a petition is something that typically is handwritten by the individuals petitioning. Now on occasion, somebody will feel this need to be neat. It does happen and a petition gets rewritten. And unfortunately you then lose all of the original signatures. So you still can place your ancestor in time and know they signed that petition, but you won't get the original signature but you can on this petition. So I always check them out. It's worth taking a look for. And actually uh, for the journal, we did write an article about the Martin County divorce petition. And I mentioned that because genealogy journals provide, can help provide context. Um, so it's one thing for you to go look and find this divorce petition, but how does that fit within the society of the time and the laws of the time? And so article, uh, genealogy journals often publish articles to give you that context. And that's what this article was about. Um, you can see there's pages of context followed then by a transcription of the name of those who signed. Um, 
And related to when you have general assembly type things, most states have a bicameral setup of an, Senate and House or, or something along those lines. You have two legislative bodies. They normally have to agree to make something a law, but they produce journals. And this is uh, definitely true across your southern states that you have these journals of the Senate and the journals of the House, or sometimes they're comboed and they were published. And in North Carolina, they exist from 1822 and beyond. And they're in that same North Carolina digital collections uh, website. And here we find here, Mr. Spade of Craven uh, presented a petition of William Holland of Craven praying for a divorce. So this doesn't mean the divorce happened, but what you get in the journals is it, that's actually the first place you'll often find mention that a petition was put forward. Then you'll find out, did it get out of committee? Did it have to go to a committee? What happened to it? So you can find out the kind of history of the petition and how it played out. And then you'll often find indication of whether it was passed or rejected. Then your laws will then reflect those that were passed. Any that were rejected, which are often many, never have a law. So that's why you're going to want to look at the Senate and House um, journals, because they're going to tell you the petitions that weren't successful. And there were a lot of petitions for all those topics I showed you that were not successful. Also, uh, for North Carolina, we're fortunate that um, some people published a book called Divorces and Separations from Petitions to the General Assembly, 1779 to 1837. So that's something that we do, too, as I'm sure uh, many of you use WorldCat or the Fort Worth Library's catalog regular, regularly to see what books they have. WorldCat can help you because if you want to access this book and it's not in the Fort Worth Library, then you can ask them to use interlibrary loan to get a copy of it from someplace that might hold it. So uh, knowing of these, uh, the books that have been created reflecting legislative petitions can also be very helpful. And this was, um, I put this here, even though it's actually a federal government petition, the reason it's important is that this was a petition seeking divorce in 1804 in Washington, D.C. But at that time, there was no local ability, there's no local authority to grant divorces in the city. And so people had to petition the federal government to get a divorce. So remember what I said about channeling your inner legal genealogist. So Revolutionary War uh, related. We're fortunate, again, um, there's the Delamar transcripts was produced by one individual that she went through the transcriptions of petitions to the General Assembly of North Carolina relating to the Revolutionary War, and she indexed those. And it is actually uh, available to North Carolina Genealogical Society members, but there is a print volume that, again, can be um, obtained through um, interlibrary loan. And it ends up that the journal also, of course, across five issues, uh, did also do kind of a version of the same information also. Now, it doesn't mean you can't access this information in other ways, but we always like finding aids. They just help us get to what we want a lot faster. And again, based on the Delamar uh, transcripts, uh, a journal article was written because of one that was really interesting. So again, just be using these uh, resources be because we don't always have direct access, even with all that's been digitized to some of the original records. But if we know of their existence, then we can query the appropriate archives to get our hands on it. Now, name changes and alterations is another thing that you see frequently in uh, the General Assembly session records. And you remember my mentioning private laws and public laws. On that same North Carolina Digital Collections website, you do have a collection of all the laws starting in April 8, 1777 to the uh, present that you can access online. Um, to look for these. So unfortunately, it's kind of hard to search across them. I won't say you can't, but it can be sometimes a, a bit tricky. So bring your patients. We're genealogists. So we know about that. And then here is a 1792 petition where somebody was seeking um, that to get a name change. And so this is what an actual petition looked like. And George Parrish uh, basically had 
with his present wife before their marriage two children they would have probably taken on her sur surname um, at this time, it looks like it was Brian because it's Wyatt and Penny Brian. And then obviously the couple married. And so he wants those uh, children to have his name. These will be a lot of what the name changes are about, that there was a bastardy that had occurred. And then at some point, either the father recognizes the children or um, something comes about where the children want to change their name to reflect their father's name, et cetera. And on the left, what I'm showing you is the Discovery Online Catalog. So it's the catalog for the State Archives of North Carolina. And I can search on name change petition and you see that you get some results and you can see some of them listed here. This one's clearly saying for the leg legitimization of children and name changes, uh, sometimes it'll be for other reasons. For example, the petition of Joshua Campbell wanting to go to Pharaoh is, and I, this is interesting. This is in 1791, 1792 time period. The petitioner wishes to have his name changed from Joshua Campbell to Joshua Pharaoh because he did not get along with his now deceased father. So this is a case where somebody doesn't want to bear the name of his father and he wants to bear a different name. And then this is the actual petition. And I did all of this from home. I could search the catalog, I could get the information on it, because this was a pre-1814 General Assembly, I could actually look at the original document. And um, what's neat is that somebody obviously was as interested with name changes as I was, because they actually produced an article focusing on the name changes just for 1813. And in that, what they state is from 1783 until 1838, there are probably more than 300 North Carolinians petitioning to alter the name, their name. And then when a petitioner is successful, then you see the act altering their name. Again, it'll be a, a private law, but not all of them were successful. And though many, as mentioned, were due to bastardy and legitimization, there were others, and sometimes we don't know. I remember searching for uh, somebody, we found the name change and we could not figure out why. There, there was, I could not find an original petition. It did not survive in the papers, et cetera. Uh, so we don't know why he changed his name. And that's like this one here. You have Marshall Christian of Granville petitions to alter his name to Marshall Hunt, no reason given. And here is um, just another petition. Again, I love showing real documents. Um, and that what was interesting about this petition, because here's the summary, he's petitioning because there's two other people that have the same exact same name in the county, and he's tired of being confused with them. So he is basically adding a middle name to his name. So it's not a middle name that he was born with, but one he's assuming to help separate him. And this was an issue. I mean, often records will indicate that they live at a certain place or they're the son of somebody, et cetera. But I can appreciate that if you have a lot of people with the same name in an area, you might want to change your name. And there's also, you get published, the, the published legislative acts, um, which we've talked about, that once something does become law, and there's this great book for North Carolina that covers 1715 to 1790. And so it kind of makes it easy. I could kind of search through it to look for um, what was the magic word, which I learned was altered. So that's always the thing we need to remember when searching a uh, published books or even original documents is what is the language that was put in use at that time. And the three that um, think records I just put up here were all cases of names being altered. Now, more of it is just the act saying that the name has been altered and here's all the rights that go with that. Normally, there's very little to nothing that tells you why it, um, the name was altered. You're hoping that the original petition may survive and give that information. And also, what about the greater good? So here we have a early petition, uh, 1796, a bill to prevent the obstructing the passage of fish up the Wicacon and Chincapin Creeks in Hertford County. So every Buddy is trying to get their livelihood. They're trying to put food on the table, et cetera. And so you have a group of individuals 
and here's the whole petition. You can see all the signatures on it where they want some relief so that they can have equal access to the fish. And then here's a South Carolina petition of somebody who had been in South Carolina, went to West Florida, so basically moved out of the country at that time, came back in, and so he's petitioning now uh, to become a citizen of the United States. And then here we have a, a early Virginia colony one, um, the inhabitants of Pamunkey Neck in 1696. They don't, don't want to be made a separate county. So see, sometimes you'll get petitions or the government will state they're planning to divide a county into two. <coughs> And in this case, there's some individuals who are saying, well, wait a minute, I don't want to have it divided um, because for whatever reasons. Often you divide counties to provide easier access to what you hope is a new courthouse that might be closer, et cetera. But that's not always what everybody wants. And that's the nice thing about petitions is they're not always for the same thing or the same side or perspective. And then here's a Delaware petition from 1802 for illegal voting practices. And again, signed by many individuals. And these are all found you know, in collections of legislative petitions um, for the states that I've mentioned. And in your handout, you're gonna find that I do include um, at the end, a list of several states, not all, um, but several to give you some ideas of where you might look for petitions. Because again, leverage that information to get a sense of where are these kinds of records found, where are petitions found, and across the different time periods. Because petitions can help fill the gaps created by courthouse fires and other disasters where county and local jurisdiction records were destroyed. Because often, again, these petitions are sent elsewhere within the state. And eventually many petitions previously handled by the General Assembly are eventually handled by lower courts, but then also county district departments offices and equivalent. Divorces and name changes are both an example because now you just have a special form you fill out or hand, you know, turn into a, a certain entity to make happen. Uh, so very different process. Um, though in a way you are still petitioning, it's just typically those petitions are uh, refused or become law. Newspapers. Um, newspapers were the word of mouth of the day. They were the Facebook, they were the CNN news, uh, how, whatever uh, description you want to use. That was how a lot of information got to a lot of individuals. And so it was not uncommon to find this information published in the newspapers across a state. And this particular uh, page from the Hillsborough Recorder in 1822 shows petitions referring to land roads, pension, Negroes, um, aka the enslaved, um, insolvents, which is related to taxation, et cetera. So you will get, you will often again see some of uh, what petitions were presented. Then other times you'll see uh, what was rejected, what became law, et cetera. Now, the thing I noticed is that many entries in the newspaper didn't identify for which county or city the petition originates. And that's true for those House and Senate journals we were talking about also. So sometimes additional research is needed. And a lot of states have published a volume like this, North Carolina government 1585 to 1979, which actually includes who were serving in all the higher levels of government throughout the history of North Carolina up to 1979. So I can look at somebody who is presenting legislation, look in this book and go, oh, okay, you're from this county. So there's a very good chance that the person you're submitting the petition on behalf is also from that same county. And the portal to Texas history, that is one of my favorite websites. Um, I do a fair amount of uh, programs for Texas audiences um, through um, Texas State Genealogical Society and elsewhere. And so I'm always looking for Texas examples and the portal of Texas history is my definitely my number one go to place. And it also has the Texas digital newspaper program. And so because of that, we can find the Fort Worth Daily Democrat there, and you can go in and then search on words like petition. 
Um, now in Texas, I've also learned search on the word memorials, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, that later, but I did a quick search and here we see the word petition used several times in this issue of the newspaper and each of these are petitions from different entities for different items. So searching since you have such ready access to the Fort Worth Daily Democrat, this can be a great way to get started to find out what might be being petitioned for locally. And I had to do nearby Collin County since that's, as I mentioned, where my kids were born. And so these are coming out of the Messenger, which is published in the county seat McKinney. And here we see a divorce petition. And then here we see an account settlement. And so again, you know, newspapers provide you great, easy access um, into petitions that have been placed before the government. Now always check the availability of a newspaper and when did that newspaper start? Sometimes you will, might have to look at a nearby newspaper um, because there might not have been a good and robust and enduring local newspaper uh, for the entire existence of the county. And here's another uh, one from the messenger in McKinney. Again, in this case, the word memorial was important to use instead of petition. So in Texas, for sure, you want to use both of them, the, both of those terms. So now let's uh, go to the governor. We're going through our sequence of we had colonial, we had general assembly. Governors get petitioned. Uh, so even though we have a general assembly, some people want to talk to the man at the top um, that, you know, that's who they're, that's who they want to approach. They don't want to go through the legislative body. They want to talk to who's at the top. And the North Carolina Digital Collections, we're fortunate, again, has governor's papers. It has some of the oldest ones um, into the early 1800s, and then it has modern ones. And so, for example, here's a 1754 petition um, to Governor Dobbs from New Hanover County residents. And it's because there was a failure of the commissioners to construct roads leading to approved ferries. <laughs> so that makes sense, doesn't it? So ferries have been approved to cross over these waterways, right, to improve the ability of individuals to navigate across the state. And yet there was not a it was not established to construct roads <laughs> to get to those. So I can imagine, yes, there being a desire. And so this has many original signatures from 1754 in this county. Then you have a petition in Halifax from 1768. <coughs> These are Halifax to William Tryon, that there was a scarcity of money. And so because there's a scarcity of money, it was an issue for them to pay taxes. So in essence, they wanted the state to make more money. And that's what states could do at this time. We did not have a nationalized uh, monetary uh, system. It was using Spanish mill dollars, proclamation money. I mean, just all kinds of currency was in play. But what I want you to notice too is remember that I talked about petitions being sometimes handwritten. When you look at this petition, you can see kind of same handwriting, same handwriting. So you know somebody rewrote part of it and then a few people then signed it after that. So you do, do assess whether you think petitions have original signatures or um, have been rewritten. And uh, previous uh, North Carolina Genealogical Society journal editor was obviously very much into petitions as he did the ones covering 1811 to 1817. So he was kind of doing the War of 1812 time period a little before and a little later, and he went through and abstracted all of those. So again, Genealogy Society Journal is providing um, some ready access to legislative uh, petitions uh, for the War of 1812 time period. And the state archives of North Carolina, just like all state archives, they have governor's papers finding aids. So you can then also look through those. A lot of times for some the earliest governors, you'll often find published volumes also um, that you can then look at the index for and seek out the word petition. And the Rutgers, um, University, their center on the American governor actually has an inventory of gubernatorial archives. So this is great. It covers actually some upfront 
some very general uh, materials in terms of higher level organization, but then it also has state for every single state, it lists how you can access those records, which led me to the Legislative Reference Library of Texas. Um, this Texas governor, you can go to the Texas governor's page, and then you can put in a keyword of petition, and it will bring up that information. Um, so again, this is a great uh, local resource that you can explore to figure out who has petitioned the governor versus what had been legislative uh, petitions. And this was just an example of, again, remember we talked about publication, that you have published executive orders um, that are, are available in digitized materials and that through that database I was able to find um, this 1855 an act relinquishing to the counties uh, for the tax years 1856 and 1857 um, so something to do with uh, the they're trying to petition for relief of the citizens of Navarro County and then it talks about notice here Senate journal text house journal etc so remember, this is something common across states and including Texas that you can find archives for Senate and House uh, journals regarding legislative petitions and also uh, through looking for uh, that governor's collection. So then the next level we have is county court, what happens uh, locally. So one category I want to talk about was road related uh, petitions. And because I, I actually do a whole talk about this, so you know I'm only going to give you a little bit about it, but there's things like seeking a new road, uh, petitioning or complaining that neighbors aren't participating, overseer incompetence, conflicts over the path of the road, damages arising from, there's a lot of things that can go on with roads that people petitioned for. And this is an example of a petition that they want a road, the best and nearest way from Abernathy's Ferry on the Catawba River to Lincoln Courthouse. And again, we see these original petitions and these are in a local county collection called road orders or sometimes they end up in miscellaneous, loose, they're loose, often loose paper collections. And then sometimes road petitions may mention women. Um, many women, <laughs> could do petitions, they could petition for divorce. There's, there's many things that they could petition for and relative to the number of men who petitioned, it's a tiny, tiny number. But they can also be mentioned in petitions. And that's what we have here is that here's a road petition with citizens signing, but they're mentioning women in the community. So again, as part of that fan club, Julia Dickinson's Lane, Tabitha Jones, and it gives the first full names of the women. Sometimes, unfortunately, we see Widow Dickinson or Miss Jones or things like that. And we're kind of fortunate in North Carolina that Stuart Dunaway has done a huge thing where he basically went and looked at all road uh, records for North Carolina because these have not been microfilmed and because oh. they've not been microfilmed, they've not been digitized by family search to provide access. And so he's published a book for every single county or sometimes more than one, and then also a history of North Carolina. Additionally, JSTOR is one of my favorite resources. I, I don't mention it as much in this talk, um, but I try to get into every talk because right now with the pandemic, you can, as an individual, access 99 free articles. That's a tremendous amount of material and there's great contextual history here. So I do a lot of researching to try to get um, contextual insight into a topic, in this case, road records, um, petitions about it, the legislation that occurred, et cetera. So keep that in mind. And also check the neighboring states as well, because it ends up that this is a petition coming out of Tennessee in Carter County, but they're seeking a wagon road from the North Carolina border. Um, and then sometimes you'll find petitions that actually cover multiple states because maybe they want this road to cross the border. But in many cases, it still becomes state by state. So North Carolina, 
probably had people petitioning initially to create a road and then Tennessee's then petitioning to link up to that same wagon road that already exists. And again, original signatures. Naturalization petitions. If I search on citizenship petition in the state archives catalog, I get 151 results. And again, going back to those General Assembly session records, that's where these petitions will have en ended up. And for one particular one, I look at the House Joint Resolutions um, for this particular year, which is 1779, and I can find that this individual becoming a citizen, admitting Thomas Britton, a citizen of the state. Now notice how short that is, because this is the petition making him. I couldn't, I didn't look in this case, there should hopefully be other paperwork one would hope his original petition, which would state, what was he a citizen of previously, et cetera, et cetera. But for early citizenship, we always don't get those kinds of details. But based on court minutes and miscellaneous court files, um, there was uh, Betty Kamen who actually created kind of an index book of naturalizations. So again, this is uh, something that fortunately people are fascinated by naturalizations because of the information they tell us and often publish books about them. And if I look at local court minutes, Wake County is where I live. Um, I look through their journal, the Wake County uh, Genealogical Society journal. I see references to Lincolnshire, England, Russia, Scotland, et cetera, because people could petition the county court. And then um, the NCGS journal has again published naturalizations um, through time. And so again, providing us ready access. And they always include the information of where the person was a native of, or sometimes in this case, a native of Scotland, but went to Philadelphia and then went to New York. Well, that's invaluable to have that information um, based on that petition for naturalization. Civil War military exemptions, um, another class of records. And um, a, a, it's a slightly more formalized process at this point as we're on the cusp of the Civil War, but they were still in essence a petition. And in essence, they were petitions because people had, they were blacksmith. And so that was considered a valued uh, trade to have in the community and that the community uh, did not want to relinquish that. And then here's another person who is a blacksmith. So you're finding people petitioning to not have to serve in the military. And the journal, we published a series about that. And you can see many of them were blacksmiths and shoemakers. Um, so they were considered uh, critical components either within the community or critical components supporting the military, though by not having to actually be enrolled. And you also find other things um, in Pamlico County miscellaneous. Remember, miscellaneous often covers a lot of neat jewels. Um, you and, and 20th century privacy laws often prevent access to adoption paperwork. And that is still true in North Carolina. Many states have uh, loosened who can get their original birth certificates, et cetera. Not true in North Carolina. And so we do find references sometimes in miscellaneous of adoption paperwork. And sometimes we have to use um, a back doorway to get in. What I will sometimes do is I'll go to Google and I will do something like petitions miscellaneous and then use this construct uh, site colon slash slash because it gives me a back way to search. And then you can see what came up as all these miscellaneous records that had the word petition in them. And then these are all the kinds of petitions that I found listed by just doing this quick search and looking to see um, what Google shared with me. And it does include things, public gates, building mills, establishing towns, restoring citizenship, and so much more. And women, as mentioned, though, due to the nature of laws of the time, mostly men petition, but it doesn't exclude, exclude them. And it wasn't just the right to vote, which we're familiar with in the 20th century. You will find women listed earlier. Um, I, I have found them in divorce records, estate matters, widow's claims, land-related, uh, toll road, ferry bridge, or a bridge that they want to establish, 
property taken by the military, tax relief, compensation for work and services, and just so much more. So don't forget your female ancestors. Um, enslaved seeking manumission and free persons of color. Um, oops, sorry, I meant to clean that one slide up. That's what happens when you do things at the last moment. So <laughs> apologies for that. So manumission is gonna be a huge collection of slides that um, or petitions that you're going to see. And that's one whole category, but it wasn't just those enslaved seeking manumission or people mostly on their behalf, because the enslaved could not petition. It had to be other individuals on their behalf. But you also have a large uh, population of free persons of color living within uh, several communities, uh, especially Eastern North Carolina and other coastal communities all along the Eastern seaboard as well as uh, you know, Louisiana and other locations. And so here we have an 1822 petition of sundry persons of color for a particular county. Well, this is an invaluable census if you wanna think about it uh, for these individuals in Hertford County because Hertford doesn't have the best records that survive. And so we really appreciate this petition that was done by them. And again, it was published in the journal which provides us with even easier access to it. And then we have something called the Digital Library on American Slavery, which one element of that collection is what's called the Race and Slavery Petitions Project. It also has um, several other projects as part of it. The runaway slave advertisements, um, the voyages transatlantic, and then the one kind of hidden here is bills of sale, uh, people not property. And we're going to focus again on the race and slavery petitions project, because this is not a North Carolina project. This is a US project because it covers all of the southern states where there are petitions regarding enslaved or free persons of color. And it includes detailed information on about 150,000 individuals extracted from almost 3000 legislative petitions and over 14,000 county court petitions. And it's a great thing because you can search on what state do you want? So I can put Texas in, I can search on certain time period. Um, you can basically search early, you know, 1775 to 1800, go up to the Civil War, whatever you want to do. Or you can put in a, a surname or a location and see what pops up. So do that. Um, there are Texas Texas is definitely included in that. I didn't find any for Fort Worth that really jumped out at me, and I might not have looked as hard as I could have, so keep that in mind. Um, and immigrants and religious adherents are another category of people who might be petitioning. Because what I did is I went through the journal and said, well, what other kind of petitions? What are we seeing? So here it's petition of Frenchmen who are seeking something within um, the country. Um, here you have Presbyterians. It was a petition of the Presbyterians of Wilmington. Here you have the Watauga settlement. So this is actually uh, Western North Carolina, Virginia, what becomes Tennessee area. And they're, they're petitioning at that point. So petitions aren't always by, um, some or petitions sometimes include these greater groups of a certain ethnic group or a certain religious group or a larger geographic area um, versus being either statewide or county specific. <coughs> and now for a bit more Texas specific, we've already had a few examples. And as mentioned, I learned that the terms petitions and memorials are both used in uh, Texas. And so I went looking for a definition and determined that a petition typically includes that something be granted or a solution. So they're petitioning for something or there's a problem and they want it handled. Where a more memorial was often a written statement of facts accompanying a petition. But what has transpired is basically in modern usage, those terms are used interchangeably. Um, so again, they are terms that historically do have um, different context. So you may find differing types of documents uh, coming 
uh, from your search. Uh, but do recognize as time went by, they did uh, become conflated. It was kind of, I think it's like local preferences. And you're very fortunate for Texas because Ancestry has the Texas Memorials and Petitions Database, 1834 to 1929. And many libraries, I didn't ask uh, Suzanne if Fort Worth does provide access to Ancestry, but my, many libraries do. Um, if they don't, Ancestry is often running free access periods or you could do a trial for a short period of time, but make sure you stop it the day before um, so you don't become a member inadvertently. And what's great about this is you can search on a location. So you can see I put in Fort Worth um, because I wanted to search on that. And I actually got to this particular one through the legal genealogist. And you'll remember my mentioning Judy Russell, because she did an article about Lone Star Memorials mentioning this database. And so again, her uh, blog is very helpful because as she finds new legal uh, databases of interest to genealogists, she creates an awareness of them. And then we can go visit those databases like this one for Ancestry. And here's an example actually for one for Dallas, um, because since I lived just north of Dallas when I was there, and you are neighboring counties, uh, so I, and, and I, I spent a lot of time at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, too, so um, in between the two of you. But it, again, you're seeing the same things I've been showing you elsewhere, which is you have this petition, then you have these original signatures, which it's invaluable. And I did search on, and apologies, I want to say it's Tarrant County. It's been too long. It's been a few decades since I've lived there. And look at all of the citizens of the county. And then look at the dates associated with them going back to at least 1853 and coming forward. And then the Im you can then look at the images for that. So this was one for 1889 I happened to look at because it caught my eye. It's the Fort Worth Citizens regulating charges of the telephone companies. And what I loved about this petition is see the names, but notice many people put their occupations. So this is like a little Fort Worth directory of the time. So not only are these citizens petitioning re about regulating the charges of telephone companies, they are also giving you information about what company they owned, who they worked for, et cetera. Even the city recorder, I just noticed that um, here, but lots of neat. So this is a neat petition. It was a lot of, of fun to find and looking for women. Um, so I was sitting here trying to think out, okay, how can I do this? How can we search for uh, women in a database that's hard to do? Well, one thing is I put misses. Well, you can see I didn't get a whole lot, but I did get a few because it's not atypical that um, names will be done as, you know, Mrs. Charles Jones, for example. Then what I did is said, oh, wait a minute, what are some female first names? And so I put in Sarah and see, once I put in Sarah, there are petitions in Texas going back to the 1830s for women. Um, so don't forget, and for one of them, this was Sarah, it's 1857. She wanted a charter for a ferry and bridge across the Trinity River at Dallas. So don't assume um, that women were not doing or engaging in activities like this, that they were just involved in the household, running the household farm, et cetera, that there were many women um, who were um, try involved in more public sphere and so had to petition. And here is her petition, including her signature uh, regarding that ferry. And remember, I mentioned the digital library on slavery. Well, I went back and revisited it. And I did find a Dallas County petition that caught my eye. And this is, shows you a sense of when you search on a location, you get a little blurb. When you click on it, it then gives you the details of uh, state location, the filing date. It gives you an overview, which tells us that 87 residents of Dallas County asked that Lewis Edmondson, a free man of color, be permitted to remain in Texas. 
so this was just a really neat petition um, to find because it's dealing with a free person of color. It was in Dallas County, uh, which is where my husband worked when we were in Texas. And it tells you who was involved and exactly where to get um, this petition. So it's just another way. I mean, obviously we have that, uh, the database on Ancestry we've just talked about, but if you don't have access uh, to Ancestry and you are looking uh, for someone who might have been enslaved or free person of color, then the Digital Library in American Slavery is an alternative for you. And you also have the Legislative Reference Library. Remember we talked about the governor's collection and how that um, provided access to petitions to the governor, uh, which again, eventually most of them end up in your legislative branch to actually be addressed. Well, you have archives just like North Carolina does of House journals and Senate journals online. So you can go to this Legislative Reference Library of Texas, and then these are chronologically in reverse. So you can go down to the lowest um, numbers available and look into those House journals and Senate journals to found, find out uh, what petitions had gone before the legislature, whether they were rejected or not, and how they were processed. And I went to the bottom, and then there's that very first one in 1846. And what's neat about this collection is it has pre-statehood ones. So I thought this was great because it goes all the way back to 1836. So it gains you 10 more years there. And it has the House Journal, Senate Journals. And at that point, there was something called the Secret Journal. And I don't know what that is, and I probably should uh, check it out. And then you also have um, Taro, which is a, a website I've play with periodically, um, the Texas Archival Resources Online. And again, I could search on petitions and it let me know that there's something called the Texas Court of Claims uh, Claims Land Petitions. Um, so this would be a whole series of petitions regarding land. And then what I found um, interesting also is that there are petitions where citizens of various states were rejecting the proposed annexation of Texas back in 1837. Uh, so I thought this might interest you <coughs> to know that uh, not everybody outside of Texas wanted Texas uh, to be annexed. But we also did find um, here we see from the Digital Public Library of America, Utica Anti-Slavery Petition for an Independent Texas. Um, so several New York locales definitely seem to be uh, caught up into uh, Texas and its annexation. But we did have some citizens of Pennsylvania in favor of the annexation. And again, this is all through the Digital Public Library of America. Just another great resource uh, to look for. And they are adding material constantly. They house nothing on the DPLA, but they are clearing house um, El to elsewhere. And I am wrapping up because I know you've been patient and I've actually hit an hour now. Um, you have Boss County Collection actually has petitions to the state legislature or government. They have created their own summary. So for this county, it's easy for you to directly go to it. Uh, they mentioned this particular uh, petition, which is Millen Dam on the Brazos River. And then you can actually, again, see the petition and the signatures um, going for that. Um, and then the Fort Worth, your public library there has wonderful digital archives. Um, so you definitely want to explore those further. And here is a, a council proceedings that I found, which was a petition on behalf of J.C. Ewing. And again, we see original signatures. Um, so right in your Fort Worth library using the digital archives, uh, you can gain access uh, to local Fort Worth petitions. And a few resources. Um, I've written a couple of articles. They're in the handout. Uh, I don't know if uh, the library gets your genealogy today or not, um, but I did a, I've done a recent two-piece article series on petitions. And check your handout. Um, it's like six pages full of information about petitions and resources uh, for discovering. And that is it. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. And I hope, if nothing, this inspires you to consider petitions as a 
way to learn more about your ancestors and their community and the times because this was a readily used uh, voice until so many laws eventually got passed that there just hasn't been the need to petition in quite the same way, though we still have petitions uh, today. Well, thank you, Diane. Uh, that was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure everything, everyone got a lot out of it. Uh, to answer your first two questions, yes, we do have Ancestry um, that they can use. And right now, the Ancestry had even been giving the home access due to the pandemic. We can't guarantee that continues. Uh, and we do have the uh, periodical you mentioned. I believe it was the uh, your genealogy. Genealogy Today. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Now, we are by appointment, but um, just like anyone could use a book by appointment, they can use a genealogy magazine uh, just to call us or email us and let us know. And that we have a few questions in the Q&A and the chat. Let's see, in the Q&A, oh, a comment. She just said, wonderful. That's great. Uh, oh, we, we like those kind of questions slash comments. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know. Oh, let me get my mouse. There we go. Well, I know sometimes my talks have been described as a water hose. So I understand if people's eyes are all spinning. And then, but that's why it's really why I like to give a detailed handout. So I'm hoping that everybody who's either watched it now or catches, um, you know, the recording to appreciate yeah. that. I, we often listen to a talk but not with plans to immediately do that kind of research. and Yeah, yeah. And then it says, okay, so we've got the post from you where they can reach you and have, um, Allison is saying she's having trouble opening the flyer. Um, you know, it should just open when you double click on it. Um, we can try resending that to you, Allison, if that will help. Mm -hmm. And she might also try downloading. Sometimes oh, okay. mail apps are funny, but if you download mm -hmm. it and save it on your computer and then try to open it, sometimes okay. that solves some of the problems. Well, then, then do Diane's suggestion. <laughs> no, okay, but if it doesn't work, <laughs> I, you talk to Suzanne. <laughs> yeah, let know, and we can, we can work on that for sure. Um, let's see. Oh, it's saying it's in publisher, but you don't have publisher. Okay, well, maybe we can change that, um, let's see, to the PDF. That was probably the promotional flyer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for that, that was our promotional flyer and not the handout, but the promotional flyer has good information for our next Ancestry in Action. And I'll go ahead and um, send that out in the PDF, Allison. So I, I know what she's talking about. I can fix that. Okay. Yeah, I, I end up using online web things to convert from pages yeah. to PDF. I mean, eventually you can always get there, but it does take time. Yeah. I know, I know, I know. Okay. And then I think, does anyone, oh, another Q&A. Oh, great. Just a wonderful. All right. Well, I think that's it then. Does anyone have any further questions before I end this webinar? No? Yep. And again, feel free to, you can email me at any time about either the talk, uh, the topic of this talk, yeah. or obviously North Carolina or Southern research in mm -hmm. general. If in a few minutes I can pass you some useful information, I will. But yes, please limit yourself and don't give me the life story of your research because yeah. I, this is this is my, my this is my business. So. 